Welcome to uh, Webinar Wednesday. Um, we're um, going to be going to be uh, doing some more of these webinars, um, and they are from remote locations. Um, we understand how uh, this COVID-19 has temporarily altered a lot of the ways that we all do business and the way we work with our customers, whether um, we're James Way itself or U.S. customers. We all had to make some changes and altering. So. Um, this is one of the ways that we're going to try to uh, be able to assist our customers a little bit better by having uh, more frequent webinars. Um, having said that, we are doing these from remote locations to kind of um, pay attention to the um, distancing of our people. So um, doing that, bear with us if we have some technical issues um, as, as we start doing this for the first time of different locations and run this webinar. The other thing we've been um, told that because there's so many different people um, using Zoom conferences and different types of uh, media like this to work at home and to interact with customers and other team members, that um, there's potential of some bandwidth issues. A lot of people using the system. Um, we haven't had that in some of our practices, but there is the potential for that. So hopefully we won't run into that, that issue. I, I know some of uh, Zoom conference, some of the others are trying hard to increase that so we don't have some of these problems, but that potential does um, still exist. Um, if you look at your um, screen, on the bottom of the screen, there's a couple little boxes, and this is some instructional things um, for the participants here. Um, there's a question and answer section, a uh, uh, little icon. If you have questions during the uh, time that um, the presentation is being made, go ahead and type out your questions and then they accumulate here for me. Then when we get to the end of the presentation, we'll be able to address some of those questions. I'll read them off and, and that way we have, um, that way we have, uh, um, sorry, it looked like I had a problem here. Okay. Um, that way we can make sure we get through time-wise and everything. Um, the other thing is, is that, um, um, we're going to kind of keep track on the time. Hopefully, we don't lose somebody. Like I said, once again. Sorry, I have a little bit of issues here. Um, okay, the topic today is um, troubleshooting in the hatchery. And we've asked Henry Cole, uh, one of our um, consultants, to um, present this. And the, the idea of this troubleshooting in the hatchery was not necessarily to specifically look at um, uh, multi-stage or a single stage or a chicken or a turkey or duck or whatever. It's kind of a general hatchery troubleshooting. And the reason why we feel like this is important is if we're not able to physically be there at your hatcheries for a period of time, the more that you can do if you have issues in troubleshooting and identifying causative factors or not, it will help us in trying to work with you remotely. And um, so you know, bear in mind that this is kind of a general type of presentation. Henry Cole um, has been with us um, since the last year, middle of last year, it's over 30 years experience in hatcheries and incubation, uh, has a lot of knowledge and expertise in this area and other incubation areas. So um, in the future, we will address maybe multi-stage, single stage and some individual things, but this is kind of a general thing. So with that, I will let Henry Cole uh, take over now and he'll be I'm doing the presentation, and um, again, towards the end of it, we will uh, address any questions that people might have. So, Henry, go ahead. Well, thank you, Keith. <clears throat> I appreciate that. Um, and hello, everyone. Welcome. Glad you can all join us for this webinar on troubleshooting your hatchery. As Keith mentioned, the principles in this presentation will hold true not only for chickens, but ducks, turkey, quail, or whatever else you might be hatching. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> so as Keith mentioned, this presentation is troubleshooting for your hatchery. And um, my name is Henry Cole hatchery consultant for James Way Incubator Company. My contact information is, is below. It'll also be at the end of this presentation if you want to get a hold of me um, and you have some um, personal questions or whatever, 
regarding your situation. So without further ado, let's get started. I'd like to leave you with some thoughts and ideas on ways to improve your hatchery troubleshooting thought process for any hatchery issue that you may come up with or, or, or face. But if you do have troubles, remember we at James Way are here to help. We're only a phone call away. So for technical phone support from anywhere in the world or any time of the day, please contact us and our Platinum Response Team at 1-226-765-0210. So when I have a trouble, when I have issues in a hatchery and I'm, and I'm trying to troubleshoot the process, the first step I do is, is I try to provide a detailed description of the problem with as much detail as possible. For example, my hatchability is below X percent. I have chick quality issues. I have issues on Mondays and Tuesday hatches, or I have issues on the end of the week hatches. You need to be as specific as you can to at least identify exactly what we're dealing with. Next, we need to ask the question, <clears throat> is this an isolated event? Is it specific to an incubator? Is it specific to a hatcher, a breeder flock, etc.? Or is this a chronic issue occurring on a regular or frequent basis? Because those are two different things. If you have a, a specific issue with an incubator or you have a chronic issue, we need to look at things differently. So it's important to identify if it's a specific issue or if it's a chronic issue. Next thing I do is I like to review hatchery data. So when I go out and, and troubleshoot hatcheries for James Way, I always ask for hatchery data. I'm looking for fertility data if you've got it, your hatch percent, your moisture loss, and on moisture loss, I find that a lot of folks aren't collecting that. And for me, I'm old school, and that's an important tool for me. Um, DOAs, your livability, hatch of fertile, those are the types of things that we need to look at. If you don't have data that you think you need to, to make a good informed decision, begin collecting that because it's hard to make a, a good decision without without data. So we need to define where the problem is occurring. Is it a flock issue? Is it an egg handling issue? Is it in an incubator, hatcher? Is it sanitation? Where is the problem occurring? So the best tool that I've found is through breakout. Residue breakout is, is a vital critical tool in identifying or helping identify where your problems are occurring. And if needed, candle breakout. <clears throat> so are your losses in early dead, mid dead, or late dead? And let me back up for a moment and, and talk a little bit more about early dead. And you can see the boxing gloves there over to the right. And there's a lot of contention between farm and hatchery on that particular topic. Because for early dead is usually in, in for the hatchery, they see that as clears, clear eggs when they're doing transfer. And they usually consider them as infertile. The breeder farms, they're like, no, we've got the fertility. It's an early dead issue. So whether you have an infertility issue or an early dead issue, we need to define which it is because they're both very distinct, separate issues. And there's two, there's very distinct, separate uh, troubleshooting pathways that we need to identify and correct those issues. So if you have an issue with early deads, we need to then go and do your candle breakout and find out if you truly have an infertile issue or if you have an, in, um, an early dead issue. <clears throat> H 
Hatchery troubleshooting or hatchability troubleshooting can be difficult at times because there are a lot of factors involved, such as different breeder flocks, different ages of breeder flocks, different egg ages, different breeds, nutritional impacts, egg collection can be different on different farms, environmental conditions, seasonal changes, your room and plenum conditions, and egg handling practices, which is everything from when the egg is laid until you set it in an incubator. So there are a lot of factors involved and we need to know more about those factors. So as I mentioned, analyzing hatch residue is a very useful management tool that can provide valuable information in isolating problems in both breeder and hatchery programs. The following will be a list of problems that may be observed and their possible causes. So let's begin. You've got chicks that are hatching late. You've set them at the normal time, but they're hatching late. What are some of the possible causes? We've got variable room temperature conditions. We could have large eggs, old eggs, or eggs that are held too long in storage. Incorrect thermometer. And what I mean with that is poor calibration. Temperature that is too low, one through 19 days, or in the incubator. And as I mentioned earlier, this, this presentation is mainly geared toward chicks, but if you're dealing with ducks or turkeys or whatever you're dealing with, um, these same causes will hold true. The days will be different as far as when they're in an incubator or a hatcher, but again, the same, you'll have the same causes. So um, temperature too low, one through 19 days. Humidity too low in the incubator, one through 19 days. Or your temperature too low in the hatchery itself. What if you have a fully developed embryo with the beak not in the air cell? Possible causes are temperatures too high the first 10 days. Your humidity can be too high on the 19th day or eggs chilled at transfer. Now I've seen this personally a number of times when transfer takes way too long and when, when it's time to pull hatch, you'll see a lot of this. So if you're having issues with transfer, my advice is, is, is put those buggies, put those racks back in that incubator get your issues solved, and then start transfer back up. Having those eggs sit out, you know, for an hour, hour and a half in the hallway or in the transfer room, not a good thing. What if you have a fully developed embryo with the beak in the air cell? Some of the causes could be the incubator, air circulation was poor, Temperature was too high from 20 to 21 days or in the hatcher. Your humidity too high, 20 to 21 days, again, in the hatcher, or you have some shell quality issues. What if you have chicks pipping early, earlier than, than they should be? You've got the right set time, but you got them pipping early. Causes, temperatures too high, days one through 19. So temperature too high in the incubator or your humidity is too low in the incubator. And again, that's where, that's where the whole moisture loss thing comes into play. If you don't know what your moisture loss is, there's a piece of information there that you don't have. What about chicks dead after pipping the shell? <clears throat> your possible causes are Eggs incubated, small end up, so upside down. You got thin shelled eggs. Eggs not turned during the first two weeks of incubation. Eggs transferred too late. Inadequate air circulation in the hatcher on days 20 to 21. Or CO2 too high in the hatcher 20 to 21. Incorrect temperature 
in the incubator during one to 19 days. Temperature too high in the hatcher, 20 to 21. Or your humidity is too low in the hatcher, 20 to 21 days. Sticky chicks. <clears throat> what, I talk, what I'm talking about with sticky chicks is when you've got chicks where the albumin is, is stuck to the backs of these chicks and onto the feathers and the down of these chicks. Possible causes are old eggs, eggs that are transferred too late, air speed that is too slow in the hatcher, 20 to 21 days, or inadequate airflow through the incubator. Your temperature could be too high in the hatcher or your humidity is too high in the hatcher. Clear eggs. <clears throat> Again, as I mentioned a few slides previous about early dead uh, and the contention between breeder farms and hatchery, it's important for hatchery managers and, and hatchery folk to understand that Clear eggs are not all infertile. Yes, you will have a percentage of them that are infertile, but you will also have a percentage of them that um, have very early embryonic mortality due to either too much fumigation of the eggs or eggs improperly held um, on, on temperature or held too long. So it's important Clear eggs are not all infertile. <clears throat> so here, here's a few pictures. On the left, we've got an infertile egg and we don't have any controlled growth. On the right, you can see where the blue arrow goes, you've got the donut, you've got the controlled, controlled growth. On day 12 or 12 hours of incubation on the left hand side again you've got the organized controlled growth and on the right we've got 24 hours of incubation and again you can see uh, how much it's growing if you have fertile eggs infertile eggs you do not have controlled growth so you need to need to re realize that and understand that, that fertile eggs, you're gonna have controlled or organized growth and infertile, you will not. So what if you have blood rings or very early embryonic mortality within the first few days of incubation? You can have old eggs, eggs that have been held too long in storage, rough handling of your hatching eggs, Holding temperature is improper, where um, you've got variations in, in your holding temperature, and that's not a good thing. Contamination issues, shell quality issues, those kind of going hand in hand. If you've got thin shells, you're typically going to have contamination issues. A younger breeder flock, humidity or excess fumigation. <clears throat> What if you've got embryos that are dying around that second week of incubation? Typically during this time, you don't have much embryonic mortality, but if you do, <clears throat> you've got eggs not cooled prior to incubation. You've got temperature too high in the incubator, temperature too low in the incubator. You could have an electronic power, electrical power failure, eggs not turned, too much CO2 in the air, so you've got inadequate ventilation in the incubator. Contamination issues, again, with shell quality issues, or your humidity isn't correct. What about malposition chicks? Eggs set small end up or upside down. Yes, you're going to have a majority of them that are malpositioned. You can also see that with increased breeder flock age and shell quality issues. Lack of proper turning will result in, in more malpositioned chicks. Low humidity, low humidity loss during incubation, lower temperatures in your hatcher, improper temperatures in your incubator, 
and improper ventilation all can cause more malpositioned chicks. What if your chicks hatch earlier than expected? You could have smaller eggs, incorrect thermometer, or again, incorrect calibration, temperature too high in your incubator, or humidity too low in your incubator. What about dehydrated chicks? Eggs were set either too early or your humidity was too low in your hatcher or chicks were left in the hatcher too long after hatching was completed. Mushy chicks. <clears throat> Some people don't understand mushy chicks, but they're chicks, big bellies, really squishy, um, and those are sanitation issues. They usually have a, a foul odor with them. Um, so you can have sanitation issues in your incubator, um, your egg flats, poor hatchery hygiene overall, or sanitation issues with your, with your hatch baskets. All can create these mushy chicks. What if you have unhealed navels, but the chicks are dry? Temperature is too low in your, in your hatcher, 20 to 21 days. You could have wide temperature variation in your incubator. Your humidity was too high in your hatcher, or the humidity was not lowered after the hatching process was completed. Now, what if you had <clears throat> unhealed navels, but the chicks were wet. Typically, that would be considered green chicks. And if you have that, I would suggest putting those, those buggies, those racks back in the hatcher and let them finish hatching properly before you pull them. Pulling green chicks is never a good thing. It opens up because you had the unhealed navel it opens up that chick and it exposes that chick to all kinds of bacteria. Um, and you've got poor hatchability and you're gonna have poor livability out on the farms. So um, green chicks, never a good thing either. Exposed brains. If you've been in the hatchery, you've seen this a time or two. Temperatures too high, uh, first few days of incubation. What about red hawks or red on your beak? <clears throat> Temperature was too high in the hatcher. You had high humidity in the hatcher or your CO2 levels were high resulting in, in low ventilation or anything else that'll force chicks to hatch sooner than normal. <clears throat> so we've gone through the breakout process what is your moisture loss? Like I mentioned, there's a lot, of, a lot of hatcheries not regularly checking their moisture loss. In a single stage hatchery, you should be somewhere around nine to 11% moisture loss. Multi-stage, 11 to 13%. And then we've got this thing called HatchCom. What does that tell you? Um, for the folks that don't have Hatchcom or for the folks that have other operating systems other than James Way, Hatchcom is our <clears throat> incubator, hatcher, and room monitoring computer. So you can, you can look at graphs from your rooms, um, your hatchers, and your incubators. A great tool. Um, and again, it's a tool. It's not... It's not to take the place of someone actually and physically going to the machines and, and looking at the machines, but it is a very valuable tool to see how the machines are operating compared to one another and how they've been operating uh, over time. So what I like to do when I'm looking at my Hatchcom is, or any computer monitoring system of your incubation equipment, <clears throat> is to see how the block of incubators, so the incubators that were set on the same day, how they compare to one another. If you've got one that is not running as the others, 
you might want to investigate as to why that's happening. And then once you look at that bank, look at, okay, the bank of incubators that were set the day before or the day after or the week before, you can compare, you can compare your incubators to one another. Same with hatchers, you can compare them to one another to see how they're, how they're operating. Very valuable tool. So, <clears throat> is your problem in the hatchery or the farm? We're gonna assume it's, it's hatchery moving forward. So, and you're still not sure what the problem can be, my next bit of advice is, is review your SOPs and your processes. Write down the entire process from start to finish, so from egg collection to chick delivery. Not what it should be, but what it actually is. A lot of times when I'm going to hatcheries, I will ask this question of hatchery managers. They will give me their SOPs or processes. When I do my further investigation, a lot of times I find what is supposed to happen isn't actually what is happening. So it's important to know what's really going on if, if you really wanna find out what's, what's happening. So your mission is to find out what's really going on in your process. And as I always say, inspect what you expect. So we need to take the appropriate steps to solve the problem. We've talked about data collection and what kind of data we need, which will give us knowledge give us some information so we can take that knowledge and inform, make an informed decision and an informed action to the problem. So when you make changes, <clears throat> um, you need to wait for the results. And if the problem isn't resolved, repeat the steps and make another change. My bit of advice is make small changes one at a time so that you can find the root cause of your problem. There are times though, a shotgun approach might be necessary in solving a problem. It will solve the problem, but however, you're not gonna necessarily know which of the solutions actually cause that problem for future reference. But if you're in dire straits and you need to get the problem solved, you may need to throw, throw the shotgun approach at it and, and you know, go after a bunch, of different, um, a bunch of different solutions all at one time. So we're gonna change gears here a little bit and talk about equipment troubleshooting for, for a few moments. And we'll start with our, we'll start with our multi-stage machines. Are you, are you regularly measuring your cabinet pressures uh, with, with, with in the multi-stage machines? If so, what is that telling you? Are you regularly doing your crossbar temperatures? What about your exit and infertile temps? What about your calibration checks? Another important thing is verification of turning. A lot of times, especially in old multi-stage hatcheries, <clears throat> your racks, your buggies are, they're not, they're not necessarily square anymore and you're having issues getting to that 45 degree turn. Um, and you're getting something that's a little less or sometimes much less than 45 degrees, which is not only gonna impact hatchability directly, but it can also impact hatchability indirectly through altering your cabinet pressures, altering then your, your crossbar temperatures and your exit end infertile temperatures. So, you know, verification of turning is, is critical. Damper adjustments in multi-stage uh, machines are also critical because if your dampers are out of, out of calibration from one another, um, that will also impact your cabinet pressures and thus impact, you know, your crossbars and everything else. 
What about your preventative maintenance, such as door seals, gaskets, your other seals within, within the incubator and gaskets within the incubator, your, your curtains, are your, do you have gaps between your racks? There's a lot of different things that maintenance could do to help troubleshoot. Your spray nozzles, making sure that they're replaced on a regular basis and we're, we're getting the proper spray. Your, your fans, your fan blades, do you have all the same fan blades within a machine? What about the correct fan spacing of the blades? Have you checked your fan RPMs? There's a lot of things that, that you can look at to improve your performance in a multi-stage machine. Again, if you have our operations manuals, please refer to that. There's a lot of information in there on all these topics um, that, or you can give us a call and, and we can help you as well. What about single stage? <clears throat> Your calibration checks for temperature, humidity, and CO2. And I'm gonna deviate for just a moment here on calibration checks. A lot of folks call me Mr. Calibration or um, you know, something along those lines. <clears throat> and, and yes, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty fanatical on proper calibration of equipment. And the reason being, folks, is it doesn't matter what incubator you have, but whatever, or whatever controller you have, but they're only as good as the calibration of that equipment. The, those controllers are taking the inputs from your temperature, humidity, CO2 sensors, <clears throat> and if they're improperly calibrated, uh, the machine doesn't know that. And it's going to, it's going to try to achieve the, the set points that you have put in for it. And if your calibrations are wrong, you're gonna have, you're gonna have some wrong results. You're gonna have some chip quality issues, guaranteed. So yes, I am fanatical about calibration and I apologize for getting on my soapbox here, but it, it needs to be said. <clears throat> uh, some other things with, with uh, single stage uh, troubleshooting is did you run the right, the correct profile? Uh, a lot of times you've got hatchery folks putting in profiles and did they put in the wrong profile? What about your damper adjustments? Again, turning. Turning is critical here as well. If you don't have a complete turn because you have air leaks uh, on your racks, again, it's going to impact not only hatchability directly, but your airflow through the machine. What about measuring the flow on your heating and, and cooling coils. Um, that's important that, to make sure that you have the right flow for both heating and cooling if you've got um, heating coils. If not, you've got electrical coils. The ECU fans, the RPMs on them, are the fan blades going in the right direction? Again, follow your preventative maintenance that's outlined in your, in your manual. Also in your manual is an equipment troubleshooting guide and a troubleshooting chart, especially on single stage. I encourage you and your maintenance folks to follow this. It not only saves you time, but it'll save you money. And the reason I'm saying that is a lot of times maintenance guys will be in there and they'll swapping out parts to find the, to find the problem for their incubator or their hatcher. In the meantime, they changed out 10 parts. Whereas if you followed the troubleshooting guide, it'll ask you questions. You answer yes, no. You start up at the top and you systematically work your way down through, through that guide for that particular issue. And it will, it will give you the answer that you need. And you'll end up changing out, you know, one part. So um, again, it'll save you time and money. When I go to hatcheries to troubleshoot equipment, this is what I do, folks. I look at the troubleshooting guides that James Way has put together, and that's how I solve the problems, is by following these guides. 
So my greatest advice is read the manual. 90% of your issues can be solved by referring to the manual. If for some reason you don't have a hard copy of your manual, you can request an electronic version from us and we'd be more than happy to send you one. And again, I, you know, I talked about Hatchcom <clears throat> and the importance of Hatchcom and, you know, we at James Way, again, we're here to help. If you're running into a situation that you, you can't resolve yourself, please give us a call. We can connect to your Hatchcom system and help assist you in finding problems. One thing I, I, I need to mention is that a lot of times we would need that, we would need access to your system and many times it will require your IT's permission. But we can help and um, it, it'll at least get us kind of in your hatchery, but not in your hatchery if you know. We can get in electronically and, and assist you if, if you need us to. And we'd be again more than happy to do that. And as, and as I mentioned before, and I mentioned on my first slide, or second slide, we're here at James Way to help you any way we can. Um, our platinum response team is, is awaiting any calls. And again, you can call us from anywhere in the world, any time of the day. Um, and please contact our platinum response team at 1-226-765-0210. And I'll leave this up for now. Uh, do we have any questions? Um, thank you, Henry. We do have several questions that I'll read off to you. Hopefully everybody can hear me now. Um, one thing I, that, you know, you've covered this, Henry covered this topic very well. And one thing I might add in troubleshooting is sometimes when I'm looking at troubleshooting, we always want to find the answer. And sometimes helping, uh, help to find the answer is to eliminate some things it cannot be, you know, so going through the process is finding commonalities of, okay, there's a problem. When is it occurring? Where is it occurring? You know, what is common? What is not? And so that if you can start eliminating some potential causes, then it narrows the field in trying to find um, the actual cause. And, and um, then it allows us to um, kind of address the issue more appropriately. Um, okay, Henry, I've got a few questions I'm going to read off to you, and, and um, some of them came along throughout the presentation. Um, one of them was when you talked about sticky chicks um, and the causes of sticky, sticky chicks can turning angle, you know, either turning or turning angle potentially cause um, sticky chicks in a hatch. Uh, yes, it, it, it can. Um, if, you, if you have improper turning, it, it can cause all kinds of issues and sticky chicks could be one of those, correct. Okay. Um, also we talk about an egg handling. Egg handling is always a big deal, it's a very broad term um, that encompasses a lot of things. Part of egg handling, I believe you mentioned in there is rough handling of eggs. How, how would you define that? What, what would be considered rough handling of eggs? <clears throat> Again, um, a, a good indicator is if you start seeing a bunch of uh, cracked eggs, micro cracked eggs, um, those are indications of rough handling. Um, again, you know, I mentioned inspect what you expect and you can't do that from an office in my opinion. You have to be out in the hatchery and seeing what's going on. So, you know, walking through the hatchery uh, throughout the day in observing folks in, in your, egg, your egg storage rooms. How are they handling, you know, the buggies, the racks? Are they, are they pushing them into one another? Or are they slamming them? How's your egg truck driver taking eggs off, you know, off the trucks? Um, is he doing it gently? Uh, or are they just, you know, whipping them off, off the trucks? And then also going out to the farms. Um, I used to do that all the time is, is go out to the farm and just see how, you know, the, the producers are, are collecting eggs. Are they running their belts too fast? Um, and, and eggs are, are dropping and, and hitting one another. So um, there's also um, uh, vibration eggs that you can, that you can purchase. 
Um, and I, and I don't know off the top of my head exactly where I got those from, but they will, they, you can put them in your, in, in your egg pack, um, on the farm and, and watch them come into the hatchery and then download that information. And you can get information on, on, you know, vibration of, of eggs. And, um, now you've got to do that for a while to kind of get a baseline of, of what's normal but sometimes that can be helpful. Um, but really it's, it's just easier taking a look at your eggs, looking at whether or not you've got, um, you know, um, micro cracks, uh, cracked eggs, those types of things. Um, and hopefully that, that answered your question. Yeah, that, that you, you mentioned the, the micro cracks and things like that. And, and that's, a, that's definitely an obvious sign of rough handling of eggs. And that seems to be a bigger problem from my experience, when we see situations um, where they maybe are not using automation and you have employees having to handle the eggs multiple times from the farm to the hatchery, moving around. And if you watch them for a while, you can start getting some um, banging a little bit of micro cracks. But there are also the issue, like you mentioned with the vibration thing, is the, the actual handling of roughing and jarring the eggs and the embryo in there that may not show up as a micro crack. So, Correct. Yeah, so that's a good tool to use. Thank you. Um, another question on, on a young breeder flock, would, uh, would you, if you're preheating eggs, would you alter your preheating of eggs in a young breeder hawk, uh, flock to kind of help with the incubation time <clears throat> or just set? Uh, you can, uh, again, I would, you know, if you do that, I would, you know, try one incubator and, and make an adjustment, um, Again, I'm, I'm not a fan of going across the board, but yeah, if, if, you're, if your chicks are, are hatching a little bit earlier, um, you may want to you know, adjust your set times or your pre-warming times a little bit so that um, they're coming in a little bit later. And I think for me, I think that adjusting your set times is probably a little bit easier to do because- I would agree. We can predict you know, if we set two hours early or two hours later, we kind of know we've got a two hour adjustment there. If you adjust, if you adjust preheating time at a much lower temperature, a two hours additional preheating is not necessarily two hours quicker incubation time difference. So I, I would agree setting, setting, changing your setting time is easier. Correct. I would agree. Um, okay. If you're operating with an egg shortage issue, what would be the impact of setting eggs immediately as they come in the, in the hatchery door? Well, if you have an egg shortage issue, I guess you don't have much of a choice. I've lived that many years, for many years, and you, you have to do what you have to do. Um, and you've got to set those eggs and, and you're just going to have to live with, with, you know, a little bit reduced hatchability or, or chick quality, but there's really not a whole lot you can do if if that's, you know, if that's what you've got to live with, then that's what you got to do, folks. Yeah, it, 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 some of our research has shown that two days after an egg is laid is really the prime time. That's when you expect the biggest hatch. If you're setting them a day early, it's not a huge loss in hatch, but it is a number. Yep. And it can be measurable, but exactly like you said, Henry, if you're short on eggs and eat eggs, your people are probably going to set them. You know, they can't yeah. avoid it. You've got to make, you've got to make that order. You've got to make that placement. So, um, you, you just, you know, you're just gonna have to figure a little bit of, you know, a little bit of lost hatchability on there. So, you know, I'd add a little, a few more eggs and you, you should be able to make it. Ideally, no, like, like Dr. Bramwell mentioned, you'd like the eggs to at least sit a few days um, before you put them in an incubator because it's important um, for the contents of the eggs to, to, to sit. But uh, if, if you have to use them, then you have to use them. Yeah, I do what you gotta do. <clears throat> okay, so there, there's a question that came up earlier on in the in talk and a couple people have asked this. I'll kind of combine the two questions, multiple questions. Moisture difference between single stage and multi-stage you know, we at James Way, we, we know what our single stage moisture loss should be at our, um, in single stage and multi-stage, and it is different. One, why is that different? Why do we 
have a different moisture loss or expected from our single stage? And what impact would it be have on hatch or, or not hatch on chick quality and performance? <clears throat> if, we're, if we're off of what our optimum is. Well, if you're off on your, on your moisture loss, as I mentioned in the presentation, you're going to have some, some chick quality issues, uh, chicks that are dehydrated, chicks that are, are going to hatch sooner than, than you expect. Um, <clears throat> so having the correct moisture loss is, is critical. Now, as far as, you know, the numbers that I gave you in the presentation for single stage 9 to 11, and, um, and in a multi-stage, you know, 11 to 13. Now remember, those are averages. So you're gonna have some that are below that and some of them that are above that. So if you move that average, say, down, so say in a multi-stage or in a single stage, you now move that, that whole uh, bell curve down, say in a single stage, you're running at 7% or 8%, you're going to have some that are, that have lost very little moisture. <clears throat> and, you know, you're still going to have a percentage of them that are going to hatch fine, but you're also going to have a greater percentage that you're going to struggle with, struggle with, um, you know, uh, chick quality and hatchability. And conversely, if you've got you know, if you're running at 14, 15%, again, that's the average, you're going to have some eggs that are almost desiccated that are, I mean, there's, there's nothing left in them and, and the chick's going to really struggle to get out. <clears throat> now, why is there a difference between single stage and, and multi-stage on, on uh, the moisture loss uh, ranges? And we got to remember <clears throat> on multi-stage, we are incubating for the average. And for single stage, we are incubating, we can more finely tune the incubation process for that embryo. So we can be a little more specific on what that embryo needs. So um, that nine to 11 is, is really what that embryo needs. But to achieve that, in a multi-stage, you need to get up to that, you know, 11 to 13, because again, the, the, the amount of variation that we have within that machine is much greater than in a single stage. Right, yeah, our, sing our single stage essentially are able to provide a more uniform heat distribution to the eggs in the machines. Therefore, we can give, like you said, we can give the embryo more precisely what it needs rather than worrying about your fringes higher and lower. So yeah, um, that's exactly right. Um, okay, you talk about calibration and I, I kind of tease you about calibration sometimes, but it's all jokingly because it's all good. <laughs> um, how, would, how would somebody, question came out, how would somebody go about um, calibrating their tools to make sure they're accurate? Because in some areas of the world, it's not, um, it's, it's not as easy to get our calibration equipment themselves recalibrated. So, I mean, is there some tricks or anything to do in that in the hatchery if you can't send them off? Well, <clears throat> um, not that I'm, I'm fully aware of. Um, the best thing would be to, um, James Way does sell a, a, a calibration thermometer per se, and it's a, it's a mercury-based thermometer and you can use that to at least calibrate your, you know, your thermistors that are doing the calibration, you know, in, in the machines. As far as um, your, your CO2 uh, calibration equipment, if you're using, you know, the gas system that we, we do have, um, there's really no calibration to that particular setup. If you have the handheld CO2 meter, yes, that needs to be calibrated. Um, and on, on that particular equipment, you can calibrate it um, <clears throat> to the outside. However, um, it, you still need to do it properly. You still need to have, you know, CO2 gas and, um, and nitrogen to, to really calibrate that equipment. 
So I guess my advice would be to have um, some calibration equipment that you don't use other than to calibrate your calibrator. So basically buy two sets and then just have one that stays in the office that you would utilize just to calibrate your the equipment that you're using to calibrate. Or even double check your, your equipment out there. With exactly. The exactly. Um, okay, can you um, help define some of the, maybe some of the major causes of leg problems? Um, if you're seeing them in, and I assume this is in um, newly hatched chicks and maybe carrying on and how incubation might play a role in that. And how incubation might play a role in that. Um, there is some, there is some research that uh, indicates that, you know, overheating during the incubation process can impact um, the development uh, of, of your legs. Um, but typically, you know, a lot of times when you're out in, you know, dealing with, you know, chicks out on the farm, um, you know, what is the nutrition of the feed? Um, that's, that's where I would look first is, you know, nutritional impacts. Um, how were the chicks, ducks, turkeys, you know, um, brooded during the initial first few days? I would look at those first before I went back and looked at your incubation side. Um, because I, I know there's folks that, that think, oh, I've got leg problems. Well, <clears throat> you know, I'm too hot in, in my hatchery. Well, what I would say to that is if that is the case, we would then see other issues that would be visible within the hatchery. And, you know, I mentioned that through the breakout residue you're gonna see other overheating issues within the hatchery. You're gonna have chick quality issues, um, you know, galore. You're, you're gonna see some other issues. You cannot have an overheating issue and have good quality chicks and then have leg problems out in the field. Just, it's, it doesn't compute. So if you have an overheating issue in the hatchery, then yes, I could see where you'd have some leg problems out in the field. So I guess I would need some more information to make a definitive, um, you know, diagnosis or, or um, a resolution to the problem. You know, if, if you've got chick quality issues in your hatchery from overheating, then yes, you could probably have some leg quality issues. But if you don't, um, then I would say I would look out in the field first before I went into the hatchery. Um. Get another question that's popped up in a couple of different ways here, so trying to summarize them. Um, in dealing with long-term storage of eggs prior to incubation, um, what would be some, first let's just deal with that, what would be some practices during storage to um, help with our hatch and, and reduce our loss of hatch? And then a follow-up, and you can incorporate these how would you would want. Um, what are some practices for long-term storage? And, and the different question was, Spideys and the uh, uh, application of spideys in a program. So I know it's a lot of stuff kind of dealing with long-term storage. You have long-term storage, short long-term storage, and then you have real long-term storage. And so you know, kind of explain how you deal with those. Well, um, <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, anyway, uh, there's, there's a lot of things we can do uh, without, I mean, without doing spideys, there are, there are some things that you can do in a hatchery, um, such as uh, if you have the ability to turn eggs, you can turn eggs. If you have the ability to lower your uh, egg storage room temperature, um, the longer you hold eggs in storage, the cooler you can, you can drive that temperature down, down to say, you know, 55, 56 degrees, I don't have a problem with. Now, remember when you do that, <clears throat> you're going to have to adjust your, your pre-warm time because your eggs are starting at a much cooler temperature. But, you know, in years past or, you know, back 30 some odd years ago, um, when I was first getting into, into the industry, you know, those were the tools that we had or setting eggs upside down, 
Um, but there's a lot of labor involved there. And then we've got this thing called Spidey's. <clears throat> and Spidey's has, has come out and it is a, it is a great tool to use. Um, I am a fan 100% for using Spidey's uh, when used and done properly, because if you don't do it properly, you can create some other issues um, with some mid dead, some, some early dead issues because of the fluctuations in temperatures. But uh, Spidey's does work. And what Spidey's stands for is short periods of incubation during egg storage. And so what you're gonna do is, um, is you're gonna take eggs, um, a, a set of eggs, and put them in, in some sort of an incubator or a heat box, something along those lines, drive the temperature up and, um, and hold them there for a period of time, two to four hours, for example, bring the temperature back down, put them into egg storage, and then you would, you'd wanna do that, you know, a few days at least prior to setting those eggs. Um, and, you know, if you're, if you're truly interested in that, uh, please give me a call, please send me an email, please send an email to, you know, the webinar host, and, and I can explain that in more detail and learn more about what you're wanting to do. But yes, yeah, Spidey's um, is, is a very useful tool. There is, a, um, <clears throat> there is a, a, a brochure or document out um, by Aviagen and they talk about Spidey's for chickens and turkeys. They've got one for turkeys as well. Um, and that's a very useful um, uh, document to, to at least learn more about the program and, and how to do Spidey's. So I would suggest doing that, but I'd be more than happy to help you any way I can. Uh, just please drop me a line. Yeah, I know Henry used Spidey's a lot in his um, last hatchery he was at because they had a lot of long-term storage. So yeah, if you want uh, more information and help with that, definitely a good resource to go to. Um, Okay, um, we've got numerous questions here. We'll try and get to as many as we can. What humidity levels are ideal for storage um, in your egg storage facility? <clears throat> Anything specific or is it not as critical? <clears throat> well, typically, um, you know, most, most manuals, most manufacturers will say, you know, in storage, you want your, you know, egg storage room to be you know, 70, 75, 80% uh, humidity. Um, I'm not necessarily a fan of that. Sometimes if your humidity is too high, uh, you can create other pr problems such as, as mold, those types of things. I certainly like it somewhere, you know, around 55 to 65 range. But again, um, that's just me personally. Um, I, you know, and if you, and if you're doing, um, if you're holding eggs for just a short period of time in your egg storage room, it's probably less important. It's certainly more important the longer you keep eggs in storage. Yeah, re really with the, if you think of the embryo itself in storage, the embryo itself can be subjected to um, changes in temperature itself, but that actual embryo that again is a day's development or so when it's in storage, is not subjected to changes in humidity because it's already bathed in the solution. So really what your humidity in your storage is doing is trying to control any excess moisture loss. And, and as the eggs move from there to hatchery and, and sweating and stuff. So, so when you're thinking of the embryo itself, it's not gonna have this shock factor of the humidity too high or too low. It's really controlling moisture loss. And when we're dealing with lower temperatures, um, you're not going to, that doesn't really facilitate increased moisture loss anyway. So, um, you know, from my experience, it's not a, um, oh, you have to have this exact actual temperature or moisture. Um, it, it's not that as critical. We're just trying to control moisture loss. And then by the end, we can measure what it was. So. Um, okay, um, several other questions again. Uh, how frequent is turning needed? Is there any factor? <laughs> frequency or angles, how critical is the angle itself? 
The angle, um, you know, most manufacturers again say that, you know, you need a 45 degree turn angle uh, to have proper hatchability. Um, James Way says the same thing. If you're, you know, I, I don't get too wound up if I'm down to say 42 or so, but once I start going less than that, um, you're, you're gonna start seeing some hatchability and you're gonna see some, some egg, some airflow issues mainly. Um, as far as frequency, you know, it's, it's standard that all incubator companies have, you know, they turn one, you know, every hour. You can adjust that with our machines and, and I think there's some other manufacturers where you can adjust the turning. Um, <clears throat> certainly out in nature, the mother hen isn't turning eggs every hour. Um, there is some research that you can turn, you know, three or four times a day, and that is sufficient. Um, but mainly, we want that every hour turn, mainly, not so much because we have to turn every hour, but it's more of an airflow thing in most incubators. You need that, you need the airflow um, uh, changing up a little bit, and, and it does that by turning the every hour. So... Turning every hour is, is more important for an airflow heat distribution uh, scenario in most incubators versus you have to turn every hour. And if you turn less, you're gonna have issues. No, you can get by with minimal turning um, provided you've got you know, the proper airflow and heat distribution throughout the cabinet. Okay. Um. Question on some sanitation um, and saying that because there's no sanitation before setting, a lot of people are not doing that. Does that increase the risk um, with high humidity and less ventilation um, if we're not sanitizing or what experience we had? Um, there's, very, there's a lot of different variables and, and options that people use, may or may not use sanitation before. Yeah, a, a, a lot of hatcheries, they don't sanitize their eggs prior to set. And again, um, you know, as long as you've got, you know, clean um, nest eggs, and if you don't and you're, you're setting, you know, some, some dirty floor eggs or dirty nest eggs, I would set them to the bottom of my racks and buggies and, and, and not scattered throughout. If I could separate those, I do and, and keep them you know, the lower part of the machine this way, if they do, you know, uh, explode, it's impacting um, less of my better eggs. <clears throat> uh, and again, this goes back to, you know, that humidity question in egg storage. Um, I, I, I don't like my humidity too high in egg storage because yes, your, your egg storage temperature should be cool enough to you know, control some bacteria growth. But if you're running, you know, 65 or 68 degrees in your um, egg cooler, you can have some bacteria growth uh, continue. And if you have higher humidity and, you know, your spray is actually getting on the eggs, you can run into some old issues uh, on your eggs. And I have seen that personally a number of times where I've got um, spots of mold on my eggs. Uh, and that's just because of, you know, droplet size too large getting on, on my eggs and, and creating some issues. Um, so again, just got to be careful and, and uh, keep an eye on that and see what's going on. If you see an issue, you know, take a look at, you know, your, your nozzles, your humidity nozzles, those types of things. And here's another question that you and I have um, encountered together and talked about quite a bit in relation to your long-term storage. So if, we're, if you have a long-term storage issue and you start lowering your egg room temperature at your hatchery, um, how should all this relate with each other from your farm egg storage for those that are storing eggs at the farm and, and then for you know three to four days and then transportation and then also storing at the hatchery? How would those relate to each other if you're going to change your hatchery egg room or lower it should you do anything to your farm stores <clears throat> well and and yes Keith you and I have talked about that um, a few times at, at some different hatcheries and um, 
what we need is when the eggs are when the eggs are laid and I don't know if you can see this but <clears throat> um, we want a V for victory and not a W for wrong and so when the egg is laid say at you know 105 degrees we want that egg to start cooling down and the coolest point in that V needs to be the hatchery egg storage room. Whatever temperature that is, whether it's 65, 68, 55 degrees, whatever, that needs to be your coolest point in, in, in that V. If you start running with issue, if you start running to, into issues when you, you come up with a W or, you know, a, a weird type of a graph where you got multiple spikes and peaks where your farm cooler temperature is below your hatchery temperature, your hatchery storage temperature. So I don't really get too hung up on exact temperatures, you know, for the farm and for the hatchery, but just got to remember that your hatchery egg storage temperature or wherever you're keeping your eggs that needs to be that needs to be the coolest point in that V, and your farm needs to be somewhere along that line. And your transportation, whether it's a straight truck, a reefer truck, whatever, needs to fit in that line as well. So, say your um, your farm temperature is seventy to seventy two degrees. I don't have a problem with that, and then have your egg truck um, somewhere around say 68 and then your hatchery at you know 65 66 that would work out pretty good um, hopefully that answers that question so, so if you lower the question was kind of related to so in your what some of your recommendations if we lower that temperature for the storage longer should we change anything else and so your answer is basically i would be no as long you don't as you need to following. change anything else Okay, perfect. Um, uh, another question, of, and, and this would be in, in, might work for various different types, I mean, it might change for different types of incubators. But if you have an incubator or, um, that has four fans in it, how much impact would there be with one fan if, it's, if one of the four is running slightly slow or slightly fast outside of the parameters? I mean, I, I, that's a, there's a variable answer, I'm sure, but can you kind of summarize um, what effect one fan off would have? Well, in our, in our machines with, with an ECU, we have four fans. And, um, and, and the nice thing about that is if one fan fails or has an issue, the other, the other fans can, can compensate for a period of time. If you know you've got a fan that the RPMs, for example, are much slower than your, than your other fans, uh, and, it's, and it's much slower than um, <clears throat> what is recommended, which I believe is around 1,700 or so RPMs. If you've got one that's running much slower, it needs to be changed out. Um, you know, it's okay for, you know, maybe a short period of time, but I would not keep setting eggs or keep transferring eggs into that hatcher with one fan that I know is not operating at, at optimal performance because it will impact the airflow and your air distribution throughout that cabinet. So again, that goes back to, you know, preventative maintenance, uh, maintenance guys checking that. I mean, if you don't have another fan motor on hand and, and that's all you have, then that's better than nothing but I would get that changed out as soon as I could. Okay, what, what would be a procedure that you would use in all your years as, as a managing a hatchery that you would use maybe for evaluating weekly egg pack coming into the hatchery? Uh, you know, I've seen different methods that people have used, companies have used to make sure that the proper eggs are coming. What is your experience that? What method would you recommend? Um, well, first of all, I would, uh, you know, I, I I like training employees and the person that is handling egg receiving, 
I, I had a form that I would use that w they would evaluate X number of trays um, <clears throat> from each breeder flock and evaluate how many eggs were upside down, how many checks, how many toe punches, how many dirties, those types of things. Um, and if he had any issues, you know, he would then get with me. I would actually physically go out and take a look at those eggs as well that are in the hatchery. And uh, because uh, of the position that I had, I was over hatchery and breeder. And so then I would go out to that breeder farm and evaluate, you know, the egg pack there and, and talk to the folks that are gathering eggs and packing eggs for the hatchery and, you know, have to do some retraining if necessary. But um, <clears throat> I would get the information from, you know, a, a, a trusted employee, a trusted individual that's been trained on, on what to look for. And then I would physically go out and inspect what I expected. I, I went out, I, I reviewed, took a look at it, and then I took corrective action, went out to the farm and, and made the changes that were necessary. Now, folks that are hatchery managers and, and they have no responsibility out on the farm, your next step would be then to take some pictures because pictures are, again, you've heard this a thousand times, they're worth a thousand words. Take pictures of your egg pack and, and show them to, you know, your breeder managers or your hatchery breeder manager and, and see if he can help you. And, you know, if the, if the problem continues, I'd be the squeaky wheel. I would complain and complain and complain about that uh, until it got resolved. Um, because <clears throat> one thing about being in a hatchery, you can't make the eggs coming into your hatchery any better than what they are. You can improve, you cannot improve fertility, you cannot improve hygiene, you can't improve anything. You can only keep it at that particular level or make things worse, but you can never make the eggs better than what you're getting. So um, if you have issues with egg, with egg pack on a particular farm, I, I'd scream up and down, jump up and down to get that squared away. Yeah, yeah. I was I always like to look at it and say the maximum hatching potential of an egg is determined at the time it is laid. Everything we do after that can only make it worse. We cannot improve that egg's hatching potential. And so all the steps after that, we're just trying to hang on and, and maintain it as, as much as we can. Okay, cool. um, just one or two more real quick. Um, we've gone a little bit longer, but a lot of good questions here. Um, so in your experience, if somebody comes up and says they're just not seeing enough moisture loss, um, what would be your first steps? Would you be just in temperature, humidity? What, what would you do if you're not seeing enough moisture loss in chicks? If, if, if I'm taking, if I'm collecting my moisture loss, I would then work on adjusting my humidity uh, profile. If you're running a single stage machine, I would adjust my humidity. Um, just a little bit. Uh, if you're running multi-stage, you can adjust your, your set point just a little bit as well if you're not running enough. Um, also with multi-stage, another thing you could do is, is run a little bit higher humidity in your room because again, um, a lot of the cooling within the machine uh, in a multi-stage, you've got cooling through um, your spray and you got cooling through the airflow going through the machine. So you can impact humidity in a multi-stage by impacting the humidity in your, in your uh, incubator setter hall. And I think that's a little bit easier to predict. For instance, if you're not losing enough moisture, I mean, you can, uh, you can uh, affect that with temperature and humidity, but like, you, like Henry said, the easiest way if you're not losing enough moisture, then you lower your moisture to make that differential, to draw more moisture out of the eggs. If you start changing temperature, yes, the temperature can have a relationship with that, but now you're also changing your incubation time and pull time and expected hatch time. Correct. So that's why it can be done with temperature, but you're safer to use humidity because that's not necessarily going to affect your, the readiness of the chicks to be pulled. So it can be done with both, but like Henry said, 
you're better off looking at humidity first. Correct. Yeah. I, I again, I would do just like Keith said, I would do uh, deal with humidity first. And if you need to make some other adjustments, you can do that, but deal with the humidity side of things first. Great. <clears throat> okay. We still have several more questions, but I think we need to wrap this up. We've gone on a little bit long. Um, any questions that we did not get to today, or if you have additional questions, go ahead and, and send them um, to, uh, I think, I believe it's a webinars, uh, jamesway.com email address, and then they can be forwarded to Henry or myself. We can address them for in anything pertaining to this presentation, but also anything at all. Um, so we um, thank all of you for uh, logging in and participating in this webinar. Had a very good turnout good discussion, a lot of good questions. We like to have that. And we hope that we can continue doing it. We plan on continuing with these more frequently to try, try and reach out and address the needs of our, of our customers. So um, again, um, you had Henry's email address phone number if you want to contact him directly or myself, but also you can go directly to the um, webinars email and ask questions and they'll be forwarded to one of us to address. So thank you again for um, coming and participating. And we look forward to um, seeing you um, at one of our next seminars coming up.